uh, and interesting ways for you to search optimize your content, promote your authors uh, and your books and drive sales. Uh, and Twitter is one aspect of that, of that process and I really look forward to, uh, to learning from you today, Jack. Thanks, guys. Um, so now, um, before I actually introduce Jack, which will be in one second, we're going to be announcing our May event shortly on um, uh, publishingpoint.com and uh, um, also on Twitter. And actually, if you go on Twitter, uh, we're going to be announcing it first, so you'll have a little bit of a head start for, for those who tweet. Uh, tweet and who follow. Um, also, we're always looking for rooms for our events, so if at your publishing house or if you know of rooms around the city, um, it would be great uh, if you could let us know. So now, without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Jack Dorsey, uh, the co-founder of Twitter, and uh, I was lucky enough to meet Jack, I guess, uh, uh, last, uh, this past summer. Uh, we were uh, sailing together, and uh, I, I told him that if he didn't come Come to the event, then he'd be going overboard. So, <laughs> yeah, really, he was kind enough to, to come and come and talk. So he is co-founder of Twitter, and now actually has gone on to start a new um, enterprise, a new company called Square, and he's also going to be telling us about that. So anyway, I wanted to welcome Jack Dorsey. So uh, thank you so much for having me. This is a, a great honor to, to, to speak to, you know, to speak with all of you. And I think um, I want to keep the, the speech part very light um, and short because I think the greatest lesson that I've learned from Twitter is um, it's really focused around an open conversation. Everything that we've done um, with the service has not actually come from any individual or from the company, but from all of the users. Um, in the virtual room that we've that we've built, um, so how how many people use Twitter today, personally, and how many people use it for their business? All right. So if I asked that question three years ago, um, people would have no idea what I was talking about, and also they would probably be offended in some way. Um, that was our first reaction. Uh, for many people was that this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Um, I don't want to know that my brother is eating a hot dog right now. It's meaningless, it's a waste of time, and it signifies the end of humanity as we know. Um, and we got all of those, uh, all of those complaints and all of those um, critiques right away. And I think, um, I think that's one of the most important things about Twitter is that it, it's really up to the user and the recipient of the content to determine its value. Um, the, the story of Twitter um, is I, uh, when I was 15 years old, um, I became fascinated by how cities work, and specifically this city, Manhattan. And I, uh, I, I just fell in love with maps, and I, I just spent hours and hours looking at maps, and <coughs> my parents thought that was the weirdest thing ever. Um, but I, uh, I just got lost in, in, this, in this data. And um, so I taught myself how to program so I could play with a map. Um, and I'm IBM PC Junior, and I taught myself how to put a map on the screen. I had this gorgeous map on the screen, and then I put some dots on the map, and then I learned how to move the dots around, and then I learned how to bound them within the map. And now I had this like, beautiful map with all these moving dots, and I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. But it was completely meaningless. It, it, you know, there, was, there was no meaning or rhyme or reason to any of the dots. So I started looking for what that was. And I found this open database of ambulances, and police cars, and fire trucks, and taxi cabs, and couriers. And uh, they're publishing 
constantly in real time where they were and what they were doing. So the where they were was interesting because now I had a location that I could assign the dot to. And I could actually watch the dot move around and that actually represented a police car or an ambulance taking a patient to you know, St. John's Mercy. Um, and and the, what they were doing was also important because if I clicked on that dot, I could see that they were indeed taking a patient um, who had a heart attack to St. John's Mercy. So suddenly I had this very rich picture of the city. I could see the city live. And I, you know, I could see all, all the bounds of, of what was happening. Um, and I was just so inspired by that. And that led me to moved to this city from St. Louis, Missouri when I was 17 years old and I found the biggest dispatch firm in the world. Happened to be in Manhattan um, on 36th Street. We had a tower in the Empire State Building and I wrote software for dispatch for emergency centers and taxi cabs and, and couriers. And what I kept coming back to is this concept of these short format updates that were published in real time that others followed. So you had all these entities constantly reporting where they are and what they were doing, um, roaming all over this metropolis. But there was one missing thing, which I discovered in 2000, which was my friends, the citizens. Like, where are the people? Where are the people on this map? Um, so I, uh, I had the first BlackBerry. I was living in Oakland, California at the time, um, trying to start a dispatch company, which was a complete failure. Um, and uh, I, I had this idea to hook up a very simple way to email from my BlackBerry when I was in the middle of the park, um, and it would broadcast out to all of my friends' email addresses in real time. So I hooked this up. Um, I was all excited. I went to uh, Golden Gate Park to the, the bison paddock. By the way, we have live bison in San Francisco in the middle of the city. Um, so I went there, and I'm like, I'm at the bison paddock, and like I'm looking at bison in the middle of San Francisco. How crazy is this? And it went out to all my friends in real time via email, and it turns out that none of them wanted to hear that. <laughs> um, and also, I was the only one with a BlackBerry at that time. It was the first little device, so that was a complete failure as well. Um, but the concept was was interesting, and it was it was sound at that time. Uh, in 2000, a lot more people were blogging. A lot more people were using a service called LiveJournal. More people were using Instant Messenger. And there was one key aspect that I, that I honed in on, on Instant Messenger that I loved, which is status. Uh, the, the, little, the little message by your name and by your friend's name that says, like, they're on the phone, or they're in a meeting, or they're away. Um, so a lot of that initial um, foray into Twitter was trying to have that same sort of status update, but to be anywhere and to update it with any device. Um, and uh, it finally took root in 2006 when I was working at a podcasting company um, as a programmer uh, with my two co-founders, um, Ev and, and Biz Stone. Um, and the interesting thing about audio was that no one was a podcaster. Um, no one actually enjoyed podcasting. Uh, we were building a product that we didn't use. Um, so. It was terrible from a morale standpoint, but it allowed for some exploration. Um, and I brought up this idea that has been nagging me since you know 2000. And you know, what if we just use you know this status mechanism, but do it from a phone? Because also at that time, there was this perfect storm because SMS was getting big in the United States, so text messaging was starting to be used in the United States. I could send a message um, from a singular phone to a Verizon phone. And that was a huge deal. Um, Europe had it for 10 years, but you know we, we finally got it. So I said, what if I could just take an SMS message and instantly send it out to my friends? What if we do that? It has nothing to do with audio, has nothing to do with podcasting, but it's something that we can work on. Um, and uh, I was given two weeks and one other programmer, and we built the basic concept of Twitter. In fact, what you see here today with this box and the timeline and the sidebar and the 140 characters in those two weeks. And um, the first message on Twitter written by a human was by me and it was saying inviting coworkers. Uh, and, and that was the start. We invited more and more people and eventually uh, here we are. 